Giselle Vergeert of Brussels is 13 and a ballet student. She hopes to become a professional dancer. Dorette Wardinier is 14 and she's already working as a lace maker in Bruges. Giselle lives in a large modern city. She speaks French. Dorette and her sisters live in an ancient medieval town. Her language is Dutch. Yet both girls live in the same tiny country. We'll find out more about how these two cultures have merged today as Discovery goes to Belgium. Discovery 70, the award-winning program for young people with Virginia Gibson and Bill Owen. Hi, and welcome to Discovery. Today we're in Brussels, the capital of Belgium, and one of the world's most international cities. Belgium's history as a nation dates back only to 1830, but the city below us and the plains that stretch in all directions were the stage for many dramatic events in European history for almost a thousand years before Belgian King Leopold I took his oath 140 years ago. During the years leading up to Belgian independence, most of the princes of Europe attempted, and for a time succeeded in dominating this area, which has been called the crossroads of Europe. Spaniards, Austrians, Dutch, Germans, French, and Italians, they all came here leaving a checkered and often grim past of greed and strife. But they left something else, too. That something is the Belgian national character, a quality that's hard to define because it's made up of two very different and very old traditions. Giselle Vergeert is the product of one of these traditions. Her language is French, but Giselle's ancestry has an international quality. Her ballet teacher, Madame Laga, is a stern taskmaster. She too is of the French tradition in Brussels. French, in fact, is the international language of ballet. The French words for the various steps and exercises of classical dance are universal. But in Belgium, the French language is not universal. A totally different language and tradition exists side by side with the French. Dorette Wardnier is the product of the second of these traditions. Although her name sounds French, she's Flemish. And she and her sister in Bruges, a medieval town, speak Dutch. Despite the many international influences on Belgium, the Flemish have retained their identity. Many Flemish people have a distinctive characteristic to their eyes, a characteristic obviously present as long as 500 years ago, when Flemish painting flowered in a great outpouring of what we now call primitive art. Dorette and her sisters could have been the models. the girls live, in many respects, seems little changed from ancient times. It was once a bustling trading center and seaport, but the creation of farm areas through land filling gradually pushed the sea away from Bruges, leaving a kind of living museum. It's little wonder that Bruges has been called the Venice of the North. Giselle Vergeert's life in Brussels is perhaps somewhat busier than that of Dorette and her sisters. Giselle and the other girls here take Madame Lagarde's class five afternoons a week. 
Giselle has been studying dance since she was three years old. It's a rigorous and demanding schedule, and one requiring top physical condition. Dancers have to train like athletes and be totally dedicated to reach their goals. But Giselle and the other girls here think it's worth the effort. Giselle and her friend Annick de Saint-Hubert both hope one day to join Belgium's National Ballet Company. It's a dream that often begins very early in life. The sidewalk cafes of Brussels hold dangerous temptations for slim-figured ballerinas. Belgians love food, particularly sweets, and Brussels open-air restaurants are favorite meeting places for people from all walks of life. Belgians always greet people and say goodbye with a handshake. There's an informal rule of etiquette which covers many social situations. Whenever in doubt, shake hands. On a free afternoon, Giselle often goes shopping and takes in some of the sights of Brussels. We'll go with her. And in the midst of this modern city, we'll find a royal palace, one of the most beautiful old town squares in Europe, and a traditional marionette theater that pokes fun at the classics. We'll do all that in just a minute. This is an entrance to Belgium's royal palace. As buildings go in Brussels, the palace is not very old. It was built during the last years of Dutch rule as a residence for the Prince of Orange. Now it serves as an office for the Belgian king and his staff, and the great state receptions are given here. Across this park is the country's parliament building, a respectful distance away, symbolizing the relationship between king and commoner in Belgium's constitutional monarchy, close but independent. This old town wall, built in the 13th century, has been preserved as part of Brussels' attempt to save its heritage. Brussels, like many other cities, is constantly growing and changing. Again, the new mixes with the old. This little park is a memorial to Brussels' golden age in the 16th century. All these noblemen played a role in Belgium's effort to achieve independence. All around the fence, on the outside of the park, are statues representing the craft guilds, which were the heart of the city's economy. Mariners, coopers, and cabinet makers, brewers, millers, and others. In the Grand Place, a great open square in the heart of the city, stand the most powerful reminders of Belgium's heritage in trade and commerce. Many of these houses served as headquarters of the guilds, organizations set up to control various industries of the day. The mariners had this house, with its representation of Neptune and other sea gods. The house called the Windmill belonged to the Miller's Guild. The Tin Pot, as it was called, belonged to the carpenters. Most of the old guild houses have now been converted into offices, museums, and restaurants. But this building, Brussels Town Hall, remains as it's been since it was built in 1696. To the citizens of Brussels, the town hall is more than merely the seat of the municipal government. Its spire, soaring 321 feet above the Grand Place, is a symbol of Belgium's long struggle for independence. And 
so the Grand Place is the heart of Brussels spiritually and is also the location of one of its flower markets. Giselle Berger is buying some flowers to take home to her mother. Belgians are great browsers in shop windows, and the number of small shops here seems far out of proportion to the size of the city, about one million people. Many of the shops are located along enclosed arcades, like this one, called the Gallery Saint-Hubert. Each of the streets in this, the old part of Brussels, has a colorful name, often a name denoting the character of the area. Here on the narrow Petite Rue des Bouchers, little street of butchers, many shops specialize in sausages, pâté, and skewered meats meant to be eaten on the spot. Just off the narrow street and down an even narrower alley, Giselle comes to a charming remnant of old Brussels. The theater tune has existed in Brussels in one form or another since 1830. Originally, it was a street theater of marionettes designed for the poor people of the city. The performances were given in a special Brussels dialect of French, a patois called Brusselsois. Over the years, what was started as a primitive puppet theater has developed into a kind of unique art form with a curious comic quality. Even tragedies like Othello are a laugh a minute, if you understand French. The present tune, or leader of the puppeteers, is a Belgian comedian, José J.L. Like the earlier tunes, he does the voices of all the characters himself, including the women. In a way, the puppets symbolize the peculiar quality of life in Brussels. For life here, for girls like Giselle Vergert, is itself a kind of patois, a mixture of things old and new, but seasoned with history and what the French call the joie de vie, the joy of living. In contrast with Giselle's life in Brussels is that of Dorette Wardinier in Bruges, a city of medieval buildings and canals. We'll see how Dorette is helping to maintain the Belgian tradition of lace making. And we'll do that in just a minute. The old town of Bruges is completely surrounded by a canal that once linked the town's thriving commerce with the North Sea in Holland. Now the old canal serves modern Bruges as a way of showing visitors around. It's 
The boatmen of Bruges are not so colorful in appearance as the famous gondoliers of Venice, but in their own way, they add to the color of the picturesque crews. Some of the bridges did not exist during the trading center days of Bruges. We find Dorette Wardinier on her way home from school. Dorette and her sisters have afternoon and weekend jobs in Bruges. They're lace makers. Dorette's father and grandfather are both shoemakers, and their shop is in front of the home. Dorette and her sisters Annie, age nine, and Karen, 13, wear the Flemish national costume in their afternoon work. Lace making is an old and revered Belgian craft that is done in Bruges now to demonstrate something of the old ways for visitors. It is said that lace making is an art which a woman never really masters. Dorette and her sisters began when they were very young, but the skill is being lost with the times as fewer and fewer girls go into the apprenticeships. When these women became lace-making apprentices, the craft was an important home industry. Belgium's lace became famous all over the world, it's an extremely intricate kind of work, always with new problems to challenge the worker. But modern technology has overtaken the making of lace. The intricate work can be duplicated by computer-operated machines. Only the most practiced eye can tell the difference between the machine-made product and the handiwork of one of these skilled lace makers. So while this lady learned the craft to earn her living, Dorette and her sisters probably will only keep up the work out of nostalgia and for their own enjoyment. This peaceful enclosure of old houses dates from the Middle Ages, when young girls were apprenticed here to wash and prepare wool for the weavers of Bruges. The girls lived a life of austerity and prayer and were called the Beguines. The place, the Beguinage, eventually became the residence of nuns, Benedictine sisters, who respect the old traditions, including the medieval costumes. Belgians tell a legend of how lace making began. A maiden was in love with a handsome prince, but was so poor it seemed hopeless. She had to spin thread day and night to provide for her widowed mother and four sisters. One day she awoke from a nap to find a wondrous pattern of flowers in silver thread on her lap. As if by magic, she was able to make the delicate pattern herself, which she sold to a wealthy merchant. She grew rich, married the prince, and lived happily ever after. So it was that Belgian lace came to be.
In this part of Belgium, they say, God made us Flemish. Only politics made us Belgian. So Dorette here in Bruges and Giselle in Brussels have two heritages, really. One they share being Belgian, while at the same time, each has her own language and way of life. Well, the Flemish way of life, built around self-reliance and independence, is in contrast with the joy of living expressed by the French-speaking Belgians. The important thing is they live side by side in modern Belgium. The differences between these two peoples only emphasize the variety of life, which makes Belgium one of the world's most interesting small countries. We'll be back in just a minute. We hope you've enjoyed our visit to Brussels and Bruges. If you'd like to find out more about Belgium and its people, ask your librarian for these books. Belgium by Noel B. Gerson, and this book, The Land and People of Belgium by Dorothy Loder. Be sure to be with us next week for another exciting program as Discovery continues to discover the world. Bye-bye. Bye. Air travel arranged through and promotional consideration furnished by Sabina Belgian World Airlines. This has been a Jules Power production in association with ABC News.